Hi, welcome to Global Politics video interview. My name is Kirill Sunitsen, and sitting next to me is Dr. Or Raviv, a professor of global politics here at Durham University. And our guest today, joining us for a discussion on privatization of warfare, is Dr. Brian Maybe, a senior lecturer of political science at Queen Mary University of London. Dr. Maybe, glad you could join us today. Thanks. I'd like to start off by first asking you to talk about any current research that you're working on. Um, my most uh, recent research is actually my public, uh, a recent publication that just came out at the end of uh, 2013, which is my book called Understanding American Power. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically a summation of uh, a long period of research uh, um, looking at American power from the standpoint of historical sociology. So I was trying to make an intervention into debates about American decline, but to actually situate them a bit differently into theoretical debates about power, but also into the history of American power as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a historical work, kind of a um, theoretical work, but also one dealing with substantial debates about the role of the US today. Mm -hmm. But it does link up to this, this work on um, privatization of, of warfare in a, in, in, a, in, in a particular way that um, one of the most important elements of the research that I've been doing over the past, I'm uh, not sure how long, uh, seven or eight years, has been on military power. And it's a, main a big component of, of the book as well. And it links up to um, a project that I'm doing on uh, US militarism at the moment, which mm -hmm. is uh, the basis of some research that I'll be presenting uh, mm -hmm. uh, today as well. As well at Durham. Yes, later on today, you'll be having a, a panel discussion on prioritization warfare. Yes. Do you mind giving us a little preview of what you'll be talking about? Yes, uh, my approach to th this topic is slightly different. I, I'm used to be much more interested in private military companies and these sorts of things as manifestations of privatization of warfare. But what I've been doing a lot more recently is to see where this fits in, into a bigger picture, into a, a kind of what we could call a political economy of warfare. And the presentation that I'm going to do today is actually going to focus on the use of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones in US uh, military policy, but to see where that fits into debates about an uh, American way of war, of how that fits into a political economy of war. And though these don't usually get discussed in terms of privatization, except in a very specific sense that some of the operators of, uh, of drones are from private companies uh, um, hired in by uh, the CIA and Department of Defense to, to do these roles. Um, but I think setting this bigger context says, says something really important about war warfare and the, the particularity of, of how the U.S. wages prepares for uh, uses of war uh, in political terms. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned private military firms. Yes. Now, in one of your papers, you write about piracy and privateers of 17th, 18th century. Yeah. Now, how does that relate to private military firms of today? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, that that work actually came out of um, of thinking about the idea of privatization and what it means. And well, it partially came out of uh, sort of a fun side project on contemporary piracy, uh, mm -hmm. especially in. in Somalia, in Somalia and the uh, Gulf of Aden. Um, but what it, what it entailed was eventually a looking back to talk about what privatization means in that context. Because usually we talk about it in terms of state, non-state. It's about taking functions that are part of the, the state sector and putting them into the private, private world. And on my own and also with my co uh, colleague Alex Kolas here at uh, Birkbeck, uh, we started thinking a little bit more about how the, the context of global political economy is really important for defining what private and public is. Mm -hmm. And what we found, looking back, was that, especially in the, the, the British and English context, that these kinds of actors that we saw as private really weren't private. They, they were very much part of state functions, and they mm -hmm. blurred the lines between being you know, private actors that were just acting in their own interests and ones that were acting in the interests of state. And it was very difficult to say uh, whether they were public or private in this, because in the kind of political economy that existed at the time, uh, in the context of mercantilism, that these actors were almost always acting in the interest of the state. When they actually uh, captured trade from enemy nations, this was in the interest of the state. So whether they were doing it for their own personal interests or with, with the direct uh, authorization of the state in terms of privateering, it was still good. Mm -hmm. and so th this is the thing that we found interesting. I mean, there's lots interesting in that historical story in all sorts of ways, but it also b gave some interesting insights into how we think about these things today, um, which is to say that the context of 
the political economy of war is quite important in thinking about uh, um, what we might call the mode of warfare mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And so the contemporary trends towards privatization, all of these things have a very particular context that come, comes out of that. I think you know, we're, uh, many are well aware of that. Um, but this is basically why I was interested in, in going back to that, w other than just the intrinsic interest in, in, in piracy and privateering. Mm -hmm. And that work with uh, Alex Collas led to an edited volume, didn't it? And it talks yeah. about the kind of different logics, or maybe the yeah. unitary logic of private and public actors. Yeah, that's uh, right. We we um, the book was a product of a workshop that we held at at Queen Mary, I think, in two thousand eight, which actually was meant to bring together scholars to deal with these historical questions um, from a variety of different kinds of actors. We looked at uh, pirates and privateers. Some colleagues looked more at uh, privateering in, in, the, in the early modern period, but all the way up to sort of present ideas about uh, private military contractors doing anti-piracy missions in, uh, um, um, in all sorts of contexts. And the book actually reflects that. It kind of goes o over a long historical period. Uh, and uh, Alex and I actually meant that as an intervention into um, a historical debate that was started by Javis Thompson, mm -hmm. who is often seen as one of the first scholars to deal with some of these these issues in the book uh, on mercenaries and uh, uh, private privateers. Uh, mm -hmm. I forget the exact year in the early 1990s when that came out. Um, uh, in terms of that book, told the story that that the way that private violence was eradicated was through state power, basically taking control over these things. It was actually by the consolidation of power, and we wanted to. Uh, to, to challenge that story somewhat, because it's partially true, but there were a lot of other things that were important as well. Um, the, the, the changing political economy was one that, that, uh, that, that she recognized but didn't uh, integrate into the work um, um, that, that we wanted to try and emphasize as part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. You briefly mentioned that um, in one of your papers that the, sorry, I'll start again. Um, Often we speak of um, private military firms as challenging the traditional notions of the state. But in one of your papers, you sort of highlight that the pirates and privateers of the 17th and 18th century have actually helped in some ways usher in the idea of the modern state. Is, it, would that be correct? Well, maybe the way of, of looking at it, and I hadn't necessarily thought about it like this, but when you've asked the question, is that, that we need to see these things not as necessarily challenging the state because the state is a is something that changes over time, mm -hmm. and it might be better to say that you know that we that sometimes these actors are going to take the lead and challenge what the, what the state looks like, but then the state becomes something else, uh, and I think this is probably what's important, and I and I think maybe I wouldn't say it's lost because some of the core issues to do with private military companies are things to do with accountability uh, and, and things like that, which are of course core to modern governance, and I, and I th think that's quite important. But when we're looking at the bigger picture, there's there's a lot of, of it about how it's indicative of how the state is changing, and, and I think that's something that I think is really important, and that's the kind of thing that I'm more interested in changing research. Mm -hmm. So in that, look in that looking back, I don't think it was so much that, that so-called private actors in, in the early modern period were, were challenging the boundaries of the state. Um, they were part of what the state was, and actually mm -hmm. it was only when states didn't really need them anymore that they managed to crack down on them, mm -hmm. when, when piracy and privateering became a, a, a real liability mm -hmm. um, to, to what states were trying to achieve, and especially in terms of uh, the British approach to f uh, free trade and developing an idea of having freedom in the seas, these kinds of things. So that's something that took a lot longer, but it's mm -hmm. part of the kind of shift in the 19th century. Uh, you briefly mentioned the changing idea of private violence was influenced by certain political economic factors mm -hmm. uh, in this in modern era. Can you talk about some of those factors? Well, the big shift, and these things are always going to be more complicated than I'm going to make them out, but I'll just get a sort of stark shift, which was basically from a global political economy that was predicated on mercantilism that was basically a zero-sum game for mm -hmm. the global political economy, um, that it was about having monopolistic control of p particular markets. And so basically, um, controlling trading routes was the most important thing. So uh, things like the British navigation laws were really, really important to s say that uh, intra-imperial trade would just be with, with Britain. I mean, that, that was uh, really crucial to that kind of system. And what really changes is that 
this becomes less and less important with industrialization and uh, other kinds of things where um, um, these monopoly routes aren't necessarily as important as, as they were. And there's a real shift towards more openness. I mean, um, it's a slight exaggeration saying that, but just to see that there's a real difference in terms of uh, um, the kind of movement that is that is rooted allowable in, in terms of the, the ocean as a space. Mm -hmm. And this is the core shift that, that happens. Um, and again, it, it's a bit of an, it's a, I don't want it to, to overplay it in some ways as well to say that this all of a sudden at one point this totally shifts. But there is, you know, a set of ideas. And, and in, mm -hmm. in fact, there's even in the period where um, laws of the sea are being codified in the, in, the, in the modern period, there's very different competing ideas of what that might look like mm -hmm. um, from ones that are more, much more exclusive, that there's zones of control to, to ones that are um, uh, looking at uh, a bigger sense of openness of the, of, of the sea and having, having, having freedom. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's something that really changes uh, eventually. It makes these kinds of actors less vi viable. It's really interesting that you bring up the kind of uh, dynamic nature of the relationship of the state with other forms of uh, private um, violence. And I was wondering, you know, if we're bringing this back to, to a more contemporary era then, if we can, and we take that insight, what does this mean for today? What are the kind of underlying shifts in the role of the state or the relationship of the state with the market that underline the, the, the re-emergence of private forms of military intervention in our current era? Well, I think that they can be fairly clearly linked up with trends towards neoliberalism. I mean, there's always a lag time in, the, in the, these things to do with the organization of, of uh, political economy and the military, though. I mean, it's something that's almost always been predominantly s something controlled by the state in some kind of way. But we see a variety of trends that start in the 1970s. And I, I'm, as a, my main area of expertise is on the, U the U.S., and it's you know been not only because of its... Uh, preponderance of military power in the international system um, in terms of its you know, uh, quantitative and qualitative superiority. But, uh, but, there, but there are uh, really important trends that it developed in terms of the political economy of, uh, uh, of the military as well, not just in terms of private actors, but the role of industry and technology. And so I th to talk about two things, I will talk about this in my presentation today as well, that there's a gradual shift to towards having a more globalized arms industry as well. And it's something that never quite takes off in the U.S., because, well, partially because the, the big players in the, uh, in, in the American arms industry still can sell most of their stuff to the American state because it, the, the, it's such a, uh, um, they spend so much money on defense, mm -hmm. so that's still s something that's, that's possible. But we see a, a, few, a few shifting trends in that. I mean, in the American context, it's majorly through mergers and acquisitions, so we s stop having a bunch of small firms and have uh, three or four. Uh, really large arms manufacturers that are also merged with the civilian sector. So um, uh, Boeing especially is a good example of that. Uh, um, it has a, a foot in both places. There's also the sense on that, on that industry side that, that whereas th the previous kinds of trends were that uh, there were uh, spin-offs from military technology into the civilian sector, and it's something that's been reversed. And we do see a lot more of that. And I think that's something th that has been part of uh, a focus on the private sector as being the dominant driver of, 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 the, of the economy in these ways. Another trend in industry, though, is for arms firms to take on all sorts of other kinds of roles that are over from the state. And Lockheed Martin is one that's done a huge variety of things, from writing the Afghan constitution to um, uh, taking over a whole bunch of s sort of so so social service kind of roles within mm -hmm. within within the U.S. But then on the on the in terms of uh, um, on the military itself, that Starting with the with the Bush, George W. Bush administration, there was a real move towards uh, um, downsizing the military itself in terms of the kinds of functions that were done, supported directly by the state. So the 2002 Quadrennial Defense Review made it very clear what this would be like, that everything outside of direct fighting functions would be taken into, uh, um, would be just be gotten rid of. So things like logistics especially would be done through private companies. Mm -hmm. um, and we, s we see the results of that in, in Iraq in many, in many ways during, uh, during the war, that there were security firms dealing, uh, private security firms dealing with many aspects of the war, um, logistics firms uh, uh, especially. And this is all 
part of the very particular way of thinking about the political economy of war, especially one that's focused on uh, professionalization, uh, uh, thinking about soldiers as workers rather than as, as it being some sort of uh, vocation related to citizenship, the state. So there's a bunch of transformations that are all sort of bundled together that, that mm -hmm. uh, go along with that. And what's, what's interesting about this is there's not a really easy way of linking them all together. And there, there's a real sense that that discussions of these things are quite ghettoized, for, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. in, 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 the, uh, in the discipline. Mm -hmm. So there's people who work on privatization of violence, there's people who work on stuff on military industrial complex, there's people who work on uh, political economy of militarism, and they're not all necessarily together. But I think all of these things can be in some ways, and it's partially due, sorry, this is my big, my third point, due to the bracketing off of uh, the study of the military from mm -hmm. everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. and this is something that I that I think is really important to reintegrate in a critical kind of kind of way, mm -hmm. and so um, so what I'm saying is that it's not an easy uh, a, an easy thing to, thing to do because you're trying to to link up all of these different trends into something coherent is quite difficult. But I think it's possible, and I th and I think it's an important thing to do as well. Um, you briefly mentioned drones. Yes. Now, what do you see the role of that moving into the future as more countries acquire this type of technology? And just recently, for example, the United States announced that it's building a, essentially a robot army. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the going to be the the new role of of the military in the future? Well, from the role of drones so far, which has gone from initially using them as a kind of surveillance uh, intelligence gathering thing as a support function for the military, this turned into be sort of the cornerstone of counterterrorism policy in the Obama mm -hmm. administration, which was a big surprise for, for many who thought that he, I mean, he did withdraw from Iraq eventually and did uh, withdraw from Afghanistan originally, but this now is the, the huge part of U.S. military policy. And I think the future is hard to predict in some, in some ways. I mean, th because there is the element of what, is all the, what does all this mean in terms of uh, uh, how wars are fought. Um, what happens, especially uh, when drones start to have their own sort of intelligence, these sorts of things. And there, there's a huge debate about what that might mean. But there seems to be a real variety of issues that are linked up with it, linked up with it in terms of um, accountability, whether or not it's about sort of a post-heroic era of warfare, um, that whether or not it will lead to more war, because, because the costs are so much lower in some ways towards mm -hmm. um, citizenry. And actually, that's more the aspect that I'm interested in the moment. Not that these other questions aren't, but linking it back up to these issues about uh, political economy and the particularity of the American way of war. Um, this tendency towards technological solutions to political problems, as political and military, military problems, has always been par part of this tradition. Um, but also solutions to the military that get away from, well, what what used to be called the, the manpower problem, that, that basically uh, the U.S. has a tradition of anti-militarism that is about mm -hmm. not having concentrations of power, not having a profession large professional standing armies. And one way of dealing with that problem is to focus on technological solutions that get away from it. And here's a perfect, a perfect one. After you know, 10 years of, of war that involved um, th the use of you know, so-called boots on the ground, that you have a way of uh, having sold you know, soldiers not involved in war at all, practically. And, and I think this is th the interesting part of this. And President Obama has talked directly about this in terms of costs um, in, a, in a speech last year to the National Defense University, you know, justified the, the drone program. And, and a lot of it was in terms of costs, you know, that mm -hmm. it's much cheaper to do this. Americans will support it because you don't have to worry about soldiers going off dying. Um, and it, it does fit into um, a problematic tendency to try and sort of bracket off these military uh, these military issues and deal with them with technological solutions that don't really affect anyone mm -hmm. except the people that are getting you know, killed by, by them. So there is a cultural aspect to that in terms of the kind of body bag effect and so on. There is an economic aspect to that in terms of the cost and um, there is a political aspect to that as well and, and what you're saying really is that we need to have a, a multidisciplinary approach to understanding these changes. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think that's I think that's right. Um, and I mean, I'm interested in, in how it fits into a particular, particularly American way of thinking about the problems of military uh, military power and how that gets used as something that 
in my own work, but I'm, I'm not the first to say that's really switched at the beginning of the Cold War to something much mm -hmm. more militarized uh, and and much less of uh, a domestic challenge to those those sorts of those, those sorts of problems. I mean, one that even in the early Cold War period there was much more contestation about mm -hmm. about the, the, the rising national security state from you know very not just from you know. Uh, um, marginal figures either. Uh, I mean, the, the person that always gets pointed to in this regard was President Eisenhower mm -hmm. in his 1961 speech mm -hmm. against the military-industrial complex is often thrown out. But this is very much in a small R Republican tradition of having a small state, a small military that's only used when necessary. I mean, history belies this sort of, but there there is a tradition of that in, mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. that seems to have sort of vanished at the end of the Cold War and started the war on, on, on terror. So. Um, this is what I'm interested. In, I'm interested in, but the, but these issues of having a multidisciplinary approach towards thinking about uh, warfare and drones, I think, is really really important. Because I think if you just focus on the technological side and those kinds of changes, you miss out the bigger context. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it in a slightly different way, is that that if you look back at the history of warfare and what you know, what kinds of revolutionary transformations they've been, they're very rarely just some piece of technology, but they fit into a bigger context. And there was a big historical de debate about the gunpowder revolution and how mm -hmm. that changed warfare. But, but if we look at the biggest changes that probably had the biggest effects on thinking about the early 20th century, there were things like the Industrial Revolution and, and also the sort of revolution of rights from the French Revolution. It was you know, uh, industrial production of weaponry, logistics through steam power, and, and uh, the levée en masse, which were the big, the big factors. And if you think of those as technology in a much broader sense, you know, we need to think about mm -hmm. drones, I think, slightly differently. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the uh, kind of neoliberal turn as, yeah. as a key aspect of that. And that makes me wonder in terms of uh, thinking about the future, because arguably we are now in a period of crisis uh, of neoliberalism, or as uh, uh, some people say, the strange non-death of neoliberalism yeah, has yeah. been yeah. offered. And uh, particularly for the U.S., that means, for example, uh, austerity. Um, in, in, in certain respects. And I'm wondering what does that mean uh, then for, for the emergence or, or is that something that is likely to increase the reliance on privatized forms of violence or is that something that is likely to, to counter this trend? The U.S. government now has less money to spend on, on military intervention. Uh, the U.S. market for d d these commodities, for these uh, uh, products is, is, is smaller. Uh, wh what are the implications of, of the, the crisis? Uh, for, for this trend? It's an interesting question because there seems to be a variety of pressures that on, on the American state that are involved in that. I mean, th the U.S. seems to have weathered the crisis better than, than, than other states in the, in the West, especially. And, I mean, it's not to say that it's all over there because there's lots of fiscal political problems in the U.S. that, that are causing that. But they never had the stark austerity that, say, Britain had. And a lot of economists in the U.S. have, have pointed out that this is the U.S. did it better, and, and even then they thought there should be more intervention, but but that's on the beside the point. I mean, so th there's some sense of that they think that that's over, and there is a discussion, obviously, about how they're going to deal with issues about, about debt and uh, uh, in, in the future. But the odd thing is that it doesn't have this seem to have much effect on the, on the defense budget. The defense budget has gone down a lot, but that was mostly through the contingency funding for the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and it's still at about 500 billion, and that still seems plenty to buy these other these other things, and the the reliance on 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 the question you asked was more about pri sorry about privatization. I mean, mm -hmm. those things are so well embedded; they don't seem to be mm -hmm. be going anywhere. And the cost cutting seems to be more about the kinds of, of um, uh, weapon systems that are, that, are that that the Defense Department is dealing with, which is still, you know. Um, part of the very difficult procurement process that's, uh, that has all sorts of special interests and pressure groups and all mm -hmm. these sorts of things. But it does seem like that it is possible. I mean, they, they, the, um, the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, managed to, to eventually cancel the F-22, which was this very hugely costly thing that was developed as a, uh, um, uh, a fighter that would be able to counter some Soviet fighter that was never actually <laughs> developed. Yeah. And, you know, this thing still caught, took ages to get, to get rid of. But it was done not through, you know, it wasn't, this is cut and now the budget's gone down. It was, you know, reallocated to other places, to staff costs, to the F-35 instead. So there's, there's, 
th there's ways in which th these things just get moved around. And so there doesn't seem to be a, a difficult conversation about funding uh, uh, defense in the US. So, so there, there's pressures from you know, the broader economy, what that's like. There's mm -hmm. pressures from within uh, the state in terms of defense planning, w what these things are being used for from interest groups. And, but that issue about intervention is an interesting one, right? Because there has been some statements about that. I think, I think it's fairly clear that what the Obama administration has, has done is to move away from th those kinds of large scale nation building projects. Um, and that's something that I, that I think, you know, it seems in the short run isn't going to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, you're probably right. I'm not sure that th if that means more privatization because it just seems to be done through through drones. I mean, if you consider that a form of privatization, um, it is and it isn't. I think there's a way of talking about it that, that, that it is because it does fit into particular trends that link up with an American sort of political economy of war. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. We're sort of talking mm -hmm. around this a little, mm -hmm. a little bit. But there obviously are challenges from the cri crisis, but I think the challenge to US foreign policy wasn't just that crisis, it was about the crisis of military power that came with the, mm -hmm. the you know, the real failures in the Iraq and mm -hmm. Afghanistan wars right. for, for whatever that was accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that undoubtedly um, Obama came in seeing these as, you know, huge, huge costly failures and how do you get out of them and what do you move towards in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Maybe a final question for you, and I'm going to put you on the spot for this one. Okay. In your opinion, is privatization of warfare good or a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll I'll not answer this in a partic particular way that sort of sort of sort of answers it. I mean, obviously, it's I wouldn't want to say it's a it's a good thing. I mean, I think all the issues that the critics point out about accountability um, have been proven fairly accurate. Mm -hmm. And when these kinds of forces, when you're talking about private security firms and these kinds of things, when they're not very well integrated into mm -hmm. national force structures, all of this it can lead to real problems. And uh, you know, we saw this in uh, in the Iraq War. Um, but on the other hand, you know, th these are sorts of problems that happen all the time in, in, in wars as well with national f forces also. And we could ask more questions about, you know, why states are going to war in particular instances rather than it just being about privatization. But I, I would say my more sort of critical answer, which is always to look back <laughs> to the past, would be that we shouldn't romanticize the way things were before either mm -hmm. nece necessarily. And I mean, because one of the things that we could think about more um, is about the links between s military service and citizenship as well, which is you know something that uh, um, you know some scholars such as uh, Martin Shaw have talked about a post-military society and these mm -hmm. sorts of things. And a lot of these privatization trends come out of that because there's less sense of uh, linking citizenship ship up to some sense of service. But I think it's problematic thinking about that in a kind of romanticized way either. That th that maybe that's not the best best road. Mm -hmm. That, that we have. So my answer is probably not a great thing, but we need to think critically about what that means mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Dr. Mavy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.